certainly felt at the time, frankly, I didn't know anybody who didn't feel it at the time, that, um, well, in the words of the songs, that, that the times were changing. In 1963, change came hard, and it came fast. The Beatles' first album, the March on Washington, desegregation, and an assassination. At first glance, sport seemed the same as it ever was. But the order was rapidly fading. America's favorite sport was changing. Folks found out there was another league worth rooting for. Hi there, football fans. It's National Pro Highlights time again. And look at that snow. Hmm. Join me for a trip around the circuit for all the big National Football League games over the The most exciting new development on the American sports scene came to life in 1960 hmm. with the birth Football League. Damn it, beside him, Jack. I got news for you. We're going to win the game, I guarantee. This has got to be one of the greatest football games I've ever seen, Paul. Never club one on This is the story of a love affair. The story of the Denver Broncos and their days in the American Football League. You can get it done. You can get it done. What's more, you got to get it done. When I came to Miami to break in, I got off the train, and there were two water fountains. And one said colored and one said white, and I came from New York, I never heard of this. So I drank out of the colored fountain. The water was nice, good and cold. And then I got on a bus to go to my uncle's house where I was gonna stay to try to break into radio. And I uh, sat in the back of the bus, and a bus driver stops the bus and says, move to the front. I said, why, well, I like the back. He said, no, the back is for the coloreds. But the 60s is when it changed. In 1963, the civil rights movement was gathering momentum. But for African Americans in all professions, including the National Football League, true equality was an elusive goal. If you go back and look at the rosters of the NFL, there was a virtual quota, unspoken, unofficial in terms of the numbers of blacks that would be allowed on a team. You might have two African-American players on a team or four, but you would never have three or five because you wanted those players to room together on the road. For you to room with a Caucasian player was just unthinkable at that time. They weren't going to do that. We were dealing with race every day because on every level we were fighting to have an equal playing field. Even after blacks were brought in, they were consigned to particular positions. You know, it was unheard of for, for Black to be a, a, a weak safety or a middle linebacker or a quarterback. Hey, you got to think if you're a quarterback or a middle linebacker, the niggers can't think. What are you talking about? And this was like standard kind of talk. I mean, people believed this shit about whites and Blacks. Now in its fourth year of existence, the American Football League had a higher percentage of black players on their rosters than the NFL. But their open door policy was not out of generosity. It was a necessity. There were very few people in the American Football League who were also members of the NAACP. If you're starting a new football league, the coin of the realm is good football players. It wasn't an overwhelming sense of justice, it was business. The league couldn't afford to have a racist bone in its body. The AFL was colorblind, yet much of America remained a segregated society. The notion that blacks and whites could be equal uh, was hard won for a lot of people in the country to accept. Every black athlete that I ever played with or against faced discrimination. 
when I was uh, captain of the Chargers, and Charlie McNeil, an African-American defensive back, our parents go to the game. My parents sat on the 40 or 50 yard line, and Charlie McNeil's parents sat in the end zone, roped off section of the end zone. We went to a movie, the management said, well, the, your black people will have to go upstairs and sit in the balcony. That's the law. So we all went up in the balcony. The whole team sat in the balcony, and 10 or 15 minutes later, the lights came on and the state police came in and discussed, and we all left the theater together. Kansas City, you had hell finding a house. You had to stay in the black neighborhood. We didn't have the same freedoms that the white players had. Finding a house may have been difficult, but by the mid-60s, African-American players had found a home in the AFL. One of the things that you notice in watching the AFL games were the number of players from small colleges and from a lot of small black colleges, Texas Southern and Grambling and uh, Prairie View and North Carolina A&T. The AFL was able to find those players more so than uh, it seemed like the NFL. Is he running at 9-4, is that right? 9 yeah. He runs at 9-4. And that's what the AFL did. I mean, the AFL gave opportunities. It was just a new day for the football players in the black colleges. The players, they had a feeling of being wanted and a feeling of belonging to the American Football League. They recruited those players aggressively. Lloyd Wells, the first full-time African-American scout in pro football. Lloyd Wells was responsible for the signing of numerous uh, players from historically black colleges. Emma Thomas, Willie Lanier, and Buck Buchanan from Grambling. Buck Buchanan broke the glass ceiling. He was the first African-American player drafted number one overall by either league. He came up big for everybody that ever played at a small African-American college. The San Diego Chargers also had a pipeline to historically black colleges. Their top scout was a young assistant coach who would later make his name with the Raiders. We wanted to win. We wanted the best players. We weren't interested in who they were or exactly where they came from. The Chargers' progressive attitude toward scouting was no surprise. Their head coach had fought discrimination his whole life. Sid Gilman was Jewish, and he'd been turned down at, by several Big Ten colleges because the alumni said, you can't have a, a, a Jewish person as a coach of our, a Big Ten team. Think about this. Think about this. Think about what would have happened if Sid Gilman had been named the head coach at Ohio State when Woody Hayes got that job. Instead of being three yards in a cloud of dust, it could have been the you know, Ohio State Express. Most NFL teams maybe had three to five black players. The Chargers had 10 to 15. In training camp, he assigned rooms by position, so there'd be a natural integration of the players. Sid was way, way ahead of his time. The coach was ahead of his time, but the team had taken a step backwards in 1962, finishing with a 4-10 and 10 record. So Gilman took an old-school approach to the 1963 season. Sid Gilman got an idea that I know he's, to this day, still considers brilliant. He decided he was gonna isolate this squad during training, away from everything that could divert their attention from football. He took us uh, due east of San Diego, out in the desert, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 miles. There were no neon lights or any distractions. There was a, an attempt to build a resort, a dude ranch up there, and it failed. The actual name of it, it was called Rough Acres. Can you imagine a town called Rough Acres? I mean, when you talk about Rough Acres Reds, the next property was Poverty Flats. So, you know, this was not the high rent district. I go into my cabin. Toilets don't work. No showers. And in the bungalows, there was some rats. Some of the room, there was some bats hanging upside down in the guy's room. That was using a donkey running around there, you know, 
really messing up the place. Once we were in a meeting and we saw this gigantic furry thing coming across the room, and it was a tarantula bigger than Ernie Ladd's hand with hair on it. I get out to the field, and I say field, but uh, using that term rather loosely because all it was was sawdust and dirt. But I bend down to pick up what I think is an arts and craft bracelet. The bracelet straightens out. It's a baby rattler. One thing that a professional team needs in training camp is the concentration. At Rough Acres, we had nothing to, to bother us. The pro football and the dude ranch are a strange mix. Then again, so were the 1963 Chargers. Sid Gilman was an eccentric genius. Defensive lineman Ernie Ladd was an off-season wrestler. And Ron Mix, their future Hall of Fame lineman, was nicknamed the Intellectual Assassin. It takes a, an unusual person to be a football player. I don't have unabashed love for football. Many people find that obscene. The majority of professional athletes do not love their sport. Frankly, my thoughts on the matter are rather confused. There was no confusion when determining the Chargers' best player. Wide receiver Lance Allworth's galloping gait and mild manner earned him the nickname Bambi. One of the most apt nicknames I've ever heard. Because Lance was, uh, you know, he was the gentlest creature in the forest. 10, 18, hot, hot, hot. He had a sense of delicacy about him. The game, as he played it, didn't have to be brutish. Let's take a close look at this catch by the fantastic Lance Dolworth. Lance Allworth was the best wide receiver of the 60s, and he played in the AFL. Allworth would become the first AFL player inducted into the Hall of Fame. But even in 1963, teammates thought he was blessed with higher powers. I remember once we were flying home from New York and we'd go through this big thunderstorm. Things were just like shaking all over. And I was really frightened. Then I thought, wait a minute, Lance is on this plane. God wouldn't kill Lance. Suddenly I was very calm. Sid Gilman was occasionally calm. He was also occasionally caustic. You don't have to go tight on it, except if you want to hold that weak safety man right. in there, see? So you go Y post, U corner. Okay. And don't fuck it up again. San Diego's style was easy to identify. A ball in the air and a bow tie on the sidelines. You know, Sid Gilman was George Hamilton. He was always suntanned. He just had an aura about him that he was in control and his team was the best. The Chargers were the dominant franchise of the early AFL, appearing in five of the first six championship games. The AFL was known as a freewheeling bombs away league, and that reputation was largely the result of San Diego and its virtuoso coach. You gonna get into Gilman too? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're gonna, you know, talk about coaches, he's just a football coach. The Einstein, the master of offensive passing game in the National and the American Football League. Let me show you how to run a hook pass. The field is 100 yards long, and it's 53 and 2 thirds yards wide. And we decided we're going to use every inch of it. We get a guy in every one of these areas, there's nobody can cover us. First time he was 50, went cover 7. Second time he was 40, still went cover 7. I haven't seen any strong coverage yet. 
the passing game, getting the ball vertically down the field, the one back offense. And again, Lance, you run that hook and, and get that leveling off period and sit down. He was doing things then in the early 60s that, that, that some teams are just getting to now. The tobacco was sometimes harsh, <coughs> but the offense was always smooth. Ten games into the 1963 season, the Chargers were 8-2 and two, and racing past the competition in the Western Division. Once Mr. Lowe gets a yard, there's no catching him. They were a state-of-the-art football team in 1963. We'd go into games where we knew we were going to win just because uh, we felt like we were better coached. The passing game got the attention. But San Diego also ranked first in defense and rushing yards. It looked like nothing could stop the Chargers' title run. But on November 22nd, 1963, the season and the nation suddenly stood still. A dark page in the annals of America has been written to the crack of an assassin's bullet. A nation mourns, the world grieves. This was a tremendous hammer to the heart uh, for the whole country. He was assassinated on a Friday. A decision had to be made probably in less than 24 hours as to whether to cancel the weekend games. Back in those days, you always played the game. If your wife had a baby, um, if a parent passed away or a family passed away, you always played the game. I wanted to play the games. I said, uh, you won't get me to play the games. Our team won't play. And I didn't know, I, was, I, I, I didn't even ask my own, but I said, I won't play the games. The AFL postponed its games. Before making his decision, NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle consulted Kennedy's press secretary, Pierre Salinger. 48 hours after the assassination, the NFL played. Saying that we did it, because they would have wanted, Kennedy would have wanted it that way, was crap. Playing that game was insane. I certainly think in the immediate aftermath, the AFL looked better in the public eye. People were glued to the television around all of that. And I think the NFL is kidding itself if it thought that it was making a big difference in how people responded. And was still focused on Dallas. On Sunday at 12.21 Eastern Time, viewers saw Jack Ruby kill Lee Harvey Oswald. Decades later, the NFL's decision to play that weekend is still controversial and misunderstood. Well, Pete Rozelle, I think, later admitted his absolute biggest mistake was playing that game. And Rozelle has said himself later on that he regretted the decision to go ahead and play the games. And I think Rozelle was quoted as saying that uh, if he had it to do over again, he wouldn't have played. There's no question. Now, when Rozelle retired in 1989, reporters asked him, Pete, what are the achievements you're proudest of? And he'd go ABC, the merger, uh, Super Bowl, and so on. And then, almost without asking the question, almost telling Pete, they'd say, I guess your biggest mistake was playing those games on Kennedy Sunday. And Pete would say, yeah, it was a tough period. It was a tough time. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty. But off camera, Pete really didn't feel that that was a big mistake. I think too much is made of that historically. A lot of criticism is leveled at Pete Rozelle. But a month later, only a month later, Sports Illustrated names him their Sportsman of the Year. So it wasn't as though the NFL was drowning in shame. That was funny because the official couldn't get the hanky out of his pocket, so he threw his hat. Gino Capaletti has been part of Patriots football for nearly half a century. 
and has seen firsthand how drastically the football landscape in New England has changed from the start. In 1960, the Boston Patriots were a team of no names and long shots, trying to find a new life in the AFL. Many of the Patriot players have taken up permanent residence in Greater Boston. The historic town of Concord is home to Captain Tony Sardisco. Tony follows the financial news with close interest. He and his family have been living in Concord since he was signed by the Patriots last year. Despite appearances, the early Patriots never had time to get comfortable in their surroundings. We were a team that could not enjoy a home field advantage because we played at so many different locations. We played uh, at Boston University Field, uh, Fenway Park, Boston College, Harvard, before we got a permanent home. But I think that you know, kind of tested our mettle, and I think it was good for us. Game time on Friday night, and the crowds gather at the ticket windows at Boston University Field pass through the gates, and enter into the excitement of professional football. Tonight, We're the only team that played in Friday nights. The, now, the reason uh, Patriots played at Friday nights at home is because in those days, the New York Giants were the biggest team in New England. They were on television Sunday afternoon, and Patriots didn't want to compete with them. I thought it was smart marketing to do it on Fridays. The Giants were very well loved, and if you probably took a poll, of who the fans were watching, probably a majority of them were watching Giants games, much more so than uh, our games. And in fact, uh, that was part of the adversity of the old Boston Patriots is trying to win those fans over to our side. Like so many of his teammates, Capaletti started his Patriots career as an anonymous player trying to find a home in pro football. In 1959, I was a quarterback for a championship football team. It was a touch football team. And the team was called Mac and Caps. And this is a team that was sponsored by a, a bar that I was working at. Capaletti was actually bartending at the time the AFL had started. And at that point, if you were a mailman, if you were a chef, if you were a school teacher, if you knew how to play football and you wanted to try out, most teams were giving you a tryout back in 1960. Uh, Capaletti got one. Lou Saban called and he says, Capaletti? And I says, yeah. And he says, listen, I'm sending you a minimum contract to 7,500. He says, and you got as good a chance as anyone to make this team. I said, wow, I went flying off the uh, couch. And when I came to the Patriots, I told them I was a defensive back and a place kicker. They were trying out various kickers, and it came down to Gino and another guy. Well, Babe Perilli was the holder, and uh, Babe and Gino were very, very close. So when they were trying the other guy, Perilli would take the snap from the center, put the ball down, and press down on the point of that ball. He kind of put a little pressure on when it was the other guy's turn. And when Gino's turn came, take the snap, put it down perfect. And Gino's drilling the field goals, the other guy's all over the place, and that took care of him. Over the next decade, Capaletti became one of the great clutch kickers in AFL history. Only one second remains to be played. Gino boots it. A tremendous come from behind win by the Patriots. But Capaletti was more than just a kicking threat. After spending his rookie season as a defensive back, he switched to receiver and became one of the league's top pass catchers. He led the AFL in scoring five times. He was the first Patriots true star. He was the first one that people began to recognize in New England and say, you know, this guy plays for the Patriots. This guy's pretty good. And Gino's star quality with the Patriots translated into star quality for the league. Capaletti, I believe, is a good enough player to be in the Hall of Fame. He's the all-time leading scorer in the American Football League. I think that in itself uh, qualifies him for that. For his accomplishments, for the points he scored, for the touchdowns he scored, the field goals, everything else, I think he absolutely positively belongs in the Hall of Fame. And Gino helped establish the Patriots, therefore helped establish the American Football League. By 1962, the Patriots were finally making some noise in Boston. A 
and they were doing so under one of the league's quietest coaches. Lou Saban had been replaced by Mike Holovac. You know, in the early stages of the American Football League, Weeb, Sid Gilman, Hank Stram, <laughs> guys at that time understood that we don't know if this league's gonna survive. So they had to give it like a little bit of the Vince McMahon stuff or the wrestling stuff. No good! They were very flamboyant, they talked a lot. Oh no! Was out of bounds! Mike could never force himself to be a personality under any circumstances. He was the most laid back, soft spoken, understated guy you could ever meet. Yeah. They were in an over, so I went back to that. 44th pick in an over, huh? No kidding. First time. Okay, that's all right. Mike was only one of these golly fish hooks kind of guys. You know, he's always been a very uh, religious guy. Oh, darn it. Now, he could get mad, but, you know, he wouldn't be outrageous. Well, anything ever happened right for us. Gee. I never heard him swear, uh, but it was uh, golly gee, fellas, you know. Gee whiz. Holovac had a unique strategy on how to best use his star kicker slash receiver. Oh, I used to be in the huddle and I'd be looking at the sideline and I said, oh, don't tell me he's taking me out on third down. You know, it's the, the key down in football. I would take him out on third down and he wondered why. I said, Gino, I said, I want you rested because you're going to kick a field goal next play. Hey, Gino. Gino, go, go at Z when I send you in from now on. Let Artie stay, all right? Yeah, he says, but I want to be in there. Maybe we won't have to kick a field goal if I'm in there. Guarantee it. There were times he would send in a running play on third down, like saying, well, we'll take the three points here. And I'm saying, he's, he thinks we're going to just get three points every time we kick the ball. I said, uh, you know, what great confidence he has in me. But I started to feel that confidence uh, through some of his actions. Gino, take your jacket off. I had the greatest of admiration for him for the way he handled people. But I think the whole team kind of settled in with Mike's calmness. And... Um, we became better players. Red, white, and blue, the 1963 Eastern Division champions of the American Football League, the star-studded Boston Patriots, continue to hold the admiration and loyalty of the football fans of New England. Under the energetic leadership of the popular Mike Holovac, head coach and general manager, Boston's gridiron Minutemen have become one of the most crowd-pleasing sports organizations in America. <laughs> In 1963, the team that was once unknown in Boston now boasted 11 AFL All-Stars, including number 72 defensive end Larry Eisenhower and number 85 future Hall of Fame middle linebacker Nick Bonaconti. Bonaconti and the defense helped lead the Patriots to the 1963 Eastern Division title. Their toughest test lay ahead in the AFL championship game when they traveled to San Diego to face Sid Gilman's potent Chargers. In my uh, humble estimation, uh, I believe that uh, their defensive unit is one of the best in all of football. People can talk about the, uh, the Bears and they can talk about the Packers defensive unit. I think that uh, the defensive unit of the uh, Boston Patriots is uh, one of the best and is equal to any in football. If the Patriots' defense was equal to any in football, then San Diego's offense would have to be considered one of the best of all time. It was an absolute perfect game, and it was just as if some type of magical essence had enveloped that entire squad. They just did it all that day. Every button they pushed worked, and uh, as good as they were, we were horrible. Patriots as a whole were a, a blitzing team. Sid Gilman devised a plan to run some decoy moves, some motion sets so that it would neutralize the blitzing defense, and that was their downfall in the 63 championship. You live by the blitz, you die by the blitz sometimes. Keith Lincoln compiled 329 rushing and receiving yards and San Diego's 51 to 10 victory left no doubt they were the AFL's best team. But with the first Super Bowl still three years away, one question remains unanswered.
Could they have beaten the NFL champs? The best team I played on was a 63 Charger team. And I would really have liked to have played the uh, NFL champion that year, the Bears. I would have given anything to have played them that year. The Bears were sort of a three yards in a cloud of dust outfit. Old time NFL team. The Chargers against the Bears in 63 really would have been a study in contrast. Most people you talk to, including the great Otto Graham, would tell you that the 63 Chargers probably would have been the winners of the first Super Bowl if it was back in 63. If you look at their ring from 1963, the ring says world champions. And they challenged the Bears to uh, a championship game. The Bears declined. And as we told people, if they want to argue, we'll let them pick the, the field, the time, and we'll even use air footballs. Ted, this is only the beginning. You have one of the youngest teams in the league, don't you? Yes, and if we can just keep them uh, mentally and physically sound, why, we should look forward to some fine football in the future. The Chargers had won the 1963 championship with 35-year-old quarterback Tobin Rote. Six years earlier, Rote led the Detroit Lions to the 1957 NFL championship, and he's the only quarterback to win titles in both leagues. But after 1959, Rote was no longer wanted by the Lions, and he eventually found a new home in the AFL. A 13-year veteran from Rice, Rote was the top passer in the Canadian Football League. He'll be a welcome addition indeed. Other AFL passers who were thought of as NFL outcasts included George Blanda, Tom Flores, Babe Perilli, and Jack Kemp. I'd been in the NFL for three years, hanging on by the, you know, by my fingernails and wanting to play pro football. There were only 12 teams in the 50s. Kemp was somebody who'd had a couple tryouts with NFL teams. He played for Buddy Parker in Pittsburgh, and they had an exhibition game in Los Angeles. And Jack Kemp was also a punter, and Parker told him to just punt it out of bounds. But Kemp just kicked this booming punt, went all the way almost down to the end zone, and then was brought back and returned for a touchdown. And Kemp sort of sheepishly went to the sidelines, and Buddy Parker was waiting for him. And he said, Kemp, you're going to be a good punter in this league someday, but not for me. You're cut. He cut him right on the sidelines during the preseason game. So that's another indication of what the mindset was in the NFL at that time. Spent a short time in Canada, came back and was out of uh, work and, and was looking around to maybe end my career, go to graduate school and study political science and uh, uh, economics and so forth, not knowing what I was going to do. And right about that time, the American League was starting to get off the ground. Kemp became a starter for the AFL's Chargers and led the team to back-to-back -back championship games in 1960 and 61. After injuring his hand during the 1962 season, Kemp was waived by San Diego and found a permanent home in Buffalo. For other quarterbacks, like the Chiefs' Len Dawson, the AFL provided new opportunities not only on the field, but off it. There were only three television stations here in Kansas City, and one of them was looking for a sportscaster, and the Chiefs recommended me. The Chiefs wanted one of their guys on that one of those stations so that they weren't getting bad mouth and hopefully to sell some tickets. And I was anchoring sports here in Kansas City on the 6 o'clock and the 10 o'clock news. Frank, you had a great year last year. What are your goals for this year? We get through practices 5.30. I'd rush through the shower and get downtown, and I was on the 6 o'clock news. And uh, defensively, as far as the Chiefs are concerned, we have some new faces out there that we have to take a look at. His appearances on the local news led to a long career in TV and radio. So far, and they should be thinking about it is, on first out, a play-action pass against... Dawson the was the AFL's all-time leading passer. Yet the media of the 60s wasn't kind to the future Hall of Famer and other so-called retread quarterbacks. Len Dawson had to deal with the perception that he was somebody who was a bench warmer in the National Football League who succeeded in the AFL just because it was a lesser league. You know, the NFL was the only ones calling them retreads, but back then it was the animosity. It was anything we can do to discredit the players, the teams, the league. That's what we're going to write about, and that's what we're going to call them. And 
and uh, people like myself weren't buying it. You know, we knew how good they were. They all felt like second-class citizens. They all felt like they had something to prove. And I think that was a common bond with all of them. You know, the quarterbacks of the AFL, my guess is they are as good as most NFL quarterbacks of the decade. But the quarterbacks that you remember, John Unitas, you know, Y.E. Tittle, you know, I think these guys are less remembered simply because they were in the AFL rather than the NFL. In its first few seasons, the AFL had gained a reputation as a league that depended on gadgets, gimmicks, and wide open offense. But from the start of their existence, the Buffalo Bills didn't fit the mold of a typical AFL team. The Bills' first head coach was Buster Ramsey, who came over from the Detroit Lions, where he had been the defensive coordinator. And, uh, you know, his defensive teams at Detroit got into the NFL championship game several times in the 50s. The team had many weaknesses we couldn't strengthen. However, Buster Ramsey didn't make an easy transition to the AFL. We lost four of our five preseason games, then four of our first five regular season contests. I've got some game action sequences over here that will show you better than I can explain what happened. I think you'll understand why I wasn't happy. Kill the lights, Breezy. <laughs> The lights went out on Ramsey after two straight losing seasons. He was replaced by former Patriots head coach Lou Saban, who instilled his own defensive philosophy in Buffalo. So we'll go to work and see if we can't uh, set up two types of defense, at least two different ideas of thinking against Lee and one against Blanda. Lou was a kind of a down-in-the-dirt uh, fundamental coach. It was the kind of team that really was, would sell well in Buffalo because they were a blue-collar town, so it was a good match in Buffalo and uh, with Lou. Buffalo Stadium was known as the Rock Pile, and its fans were hardcore. It's the only place I've ever been to when you walked off after a game, we put our helmets on because you got hit with full beer cans. And I can understand if someone's going to throw an empty bottle or something at you. But this is the only place that they actually threw full beer at you, which is kind of crazy. It was nice, though, because you could, you know, you'd catch one and have one on the way to the locker room, if you, you know, if you're, you're lucky enough to grab one. Under Saban, the Bills became as tough as their fans. They were probably the first team that kind of looked like an NFL team. They were, they were running more than they were passing. Their defense just was overpowering. defense included an unknown named Marty Schottenheimer, who was simply grateful for a job in Buffalo. Just a young guy, happy to be playing professional football, and I got a two-year no-cut contract. I think it was $24,000 for each of those years. Uh, I got a nice signing bonus, uh, 10000 or something like that, and a new Buick Riviera. <laughs> right now, it's time to take a step forward. Schottenheimer would enjoy a nearly 40-year ride in pro football, including more than 20 as a head coach. Everything is possible together. Hey, let's go. This is football, man. This is why we're out here. In his playing days, however, life wasn't so easy on the sidelines. Schottenheimer was mainly a special teamer, who found it impossible to crack the starting lineup of Buffalo's talented defense. John Tracy, Mike Stratton, and Harry Jacobs, as a linebacking core, played together for 67 straight games. That's four or five seasons. Harry Jacobs was called the baby-faced assassin. <laughs> I guess for obvious reasons, he, was, he had a pudgy little face, and he was a hard hitter was not particularly great athlete, but Harry found ways to get things done, and uh, he just ran the whole thing, making all the calls. Let's go, we gotta stop him right here, nothing. Red, red, right, double wing, red. Outside, outside, move. 
Move head up, sis. Outside! He was really the captain of the ship when it came to, to the defense in terms of running the show. OK, nothing. It's going to work. We can't have nothing. Let's get those hands up here, baby. It's going to work. He's going to make first tackle, huh? All Let's go, us. baby. All of us. Let's make the first one again, baby. He and I were in very tough competition because I couldn't crack the lineup. Harry understood the game. I went to him because I'm trying to pick his brain. What did you do against the first wing? We had thunder on. Though Schottenheimer's number had changed from 56 to 57, his eagerness to learn from Jacobs remained constant. Yellow dog four? No, that was uh, six one. Oh, 61. Yeah. Same. I want to get some of this information that he's got because clearly the reason he was in their plan was because of his command of the game and his understanding of how, how things were to be done. Nobody scores. Let's go. Uh, 44 short. Against Jacobs and the Bills, the AFL's most wide open offenses were slammed shut. In 1964 and 65, Buffalo gave up the fewest points in the league. During that two year span, the Bills went 17 straight games without allowing a rushing touchdown, a pro football record that still stands. I think it lent itself to the way that Lou Saban wanted to play football. He's going to play defense, and uh, he was going to smack you in the mouth on offense. He was going to run over you. The runaway vehicle in Saban's offense was number 34, Cookie Gilchrist. And while his runs usually resulted in a crash, he always arrived in style. He had a huge pink Cadillac and painted on the front grill backwards was looky, looky, here comes Cookie. So in your rear view mirror, you had no doubt who it was. As if people in Buffalo didn't know a six foot five, 250 pound black guy with sunglasses driving a pink Cadillac was Cookie Gilchrist. In 1962, Gilchrist became the AFL's first thousand yard rusher. Cookie Gilchrist, pound for pound, inch for inch, the greatest all around football player that I ever played with or watched play. Cookie enjoyed running the ball straight ahead so that he could get to hit somebody. And it didn't matter if I was in his way or the guy I was supposed to block was in his way. You know, he was gonna hit somebody. And uh, some of the hardest licks I've ever gotten were from the backside with Cookie. I remember a game against the Patriots in which uh, Chuck Shana went to tackle him, and he ran right over Shana and knocked him out. Other defensive guys are kind of gathered around him when Cookie walks right into the other huddle and says, which one of you motherfuckers is next? <laughs> to go with the AFL's most punishing runner, the Bills' offense also had one of the league's most rugged quarterbacks in Jack Kemp. He was very tough. He once broke his hand, and while the hand was healing, he had the doctor form it around a football so that when it healed, he would be, still be able to hold the ball and throw it. Jack had as strong an arm as I've ever seen. I mean, he used to go out there and stand on one 10-yard line and launch one of those things down there, and literally, he could hit the goal line, and he could throw the ball 90 yards in the air. I've never seen anything like it in my life certainly before and, and not since. Kemp's greatest attribute, however, was a mind that went beyond football. We referenced to him as the senator. Even at that time, he had a, a tremendous, tremendous interest in the political field and most things intellectual. I mean, he, he was not your typical 1960s football player. To me, I've always felt that quarterbacking is about 90% mental. That is, there are many football players, many quarterbacks who can throw and carry out the mechanics of quarterbacking. But in the final analysis, the difference between the average uh, quarterbacks and the good ones are the ones that 
uh, who can handle the, the mental aspect, that is the audibleizing and, and the calling of plays. You know, we knew that Jack was going to be a politician when in the huddle he would call a in sweep and tell us not to take it too far to the left or too far to the right. So he was kind of down the middle. <laughs> you know, if guys were on a plane uh, playing cards or cutting up, listening to music, you know, Jack was reading some far out book. He used to come in the locker room with all these big books, you know, on the politics and uh, conservation. And I can remember Lou Saban, our coach, saying, Jack, forget those books. Get your mind on football. Let's get with it. I know there's been a lot of teasing of me that I was more interested in politics or reading the Wall Street Journal than I was in the playbook. But uh, I knew football. I loved it. Maybe I didn't have the love of the X's and O's that some people have. There's a school of thought that if he had ate and slept and lived free the football, he might have been a better quarterback. But by the same token, he wouldn't have been as nearly an inter as interesting a person. But the future congressman didn't always win the vote of the Buffalo fans, who showed strong support for number 12, backup Darrell LaMonica. West Side Buffalo was for LaMonica, and uh, other parts were for me. And it was, it was a two-quarterback town. And I'd get booed when I went in, and he'd get cheered when he was standing up on the sidelines. Kemp's first two seasons in Buffalo ended with the Bills falling short of the championship game. In 63, we lost to Boston. We got booed. I went up to Coach Saban, and I said, Coach, next year we're going to win. And you and I are going to come out in the middle of the uh, crowd, and we're going to look at all these people who are booing us today, and, uh, you know, uh, we're going to have our moment in the sun. And don't forget that. I told Coach. Saban. In 1964, Kemp led the Bills to a 9-0 start. But in week 10, he found himself in a political firestorm with Cookie Gilchrist. We were behind, and I was throwing. But he wanted to run, and you know we came to uh, loggerheads in the huddle. And uh, you can't have anybody talking in a huddle. So I told him to leave. And uh, he got mad at me and the coach and walked off, stormed off, sat down, wouldn't come back took himself off the game, sent his backup Willie Ross into the game. Uh, Lou Saban was livid and wanted to suspend him from the team. And it was through the ability of Jack Kemp to arbitrate between Gilchrist and the coach that he actually got back on the team. You could get exasperated with him, but uh, the team knew that we had to have him to go to the championship. Uh, a, B, everybody, everybody liked him. Gilchrist returned without missing a game and in 1964 earned his second AFL rushing title. The star runner helped guide the Bills to the AFL championship game against the Chargers and running back Keith Lincoln. A year earlier, Lincoln had rushed for more than 200 yards in the 1963 championship game, and now he helped the Chargers to an early 7-0 lead in Buffalo. But fittingly, the Bills' defense changed the course of the game. Sometimes a singular play like that defines a moment, defines a team, defines a season, and it did all that for Buffalo. And it grew to mythical proportions. The tackle heard round the world. Keith Lincoln is hit by Mike Stratton, and Lincoln is through for the day. When Keith went down, it was as though the lifeblood of the whole team had been sucked dry. And we all just started looking up and down at each other, and there was nothing more you could do. He was gone. With Lincoln out, the Bills overpowered the favored Chargers. The quarterback who had been cut from the NFL, let go by the Chargers, and booed a year earlier by his hometown fans, was now a champion. I went over to Saban and I said, hey, let's go out in the middle of the field and give everybody the victory salute. <laughs> and uh, he laughed and all of a sudden I got picked up on people's shoulders. It was a powerful moment in our lives. But I think for me, what was the greatest thrill would be to go back in 65 and do it again in San Diego. 
In 1965, Jack Kemp was the AFL's most valuable player, but the Bills' strength was still their defense, and they again dominated Sid Gilman's Chargers in the title game. The league once dictated by high-scoring offense was now ruled by a new kind of champion. The Bills of the 1960s really elevated the AFL stature in the sense that they weren't just this crazy, pass-happy team. They were a very balanced, very disciplined team. So Buffalo had a very, very pivotal role, not only in the success of the AFL, but in the image of the AFL. In July of 1964, the Civil Rights Act was signed, outlawing discrimination in public places. We must not approach this law in a vengeful spirit. Its purpose is not to punish. Its purpose is not to divide, but to end divisions, divisions which have lasted all too long. The letter of the law changed instantly but the spirit of the country would take time. In the South and Southwest, desegregation was far from what the law uh, required it to be. Six months after the Civil Rights Act was signed, the AFL All-Star Game was scheduled for New Orleans, a city without a professional sports team. We were trying very hard to, to acquire uh, either an NFL or AFL expansion franchise for the city. That's why the game was put down there to see what type of drawing power um, the AFL would have with an all-star game. Black players soon discovered that New Orleans' red carpet was for whites only. In the restaurants, the patrons didn't want us to sit anywhere near them or the, the coats, we'd hang our coats on the wall and say, hey, don't put your coat next to mine. I checked in, and I hear in the background somebody ask a question, well, was that Ernie Ladd? And another guy in the background says, uh, no, Ernie Ladd's a bigger nigger than that. That's, that lad is a big nigger. I get on the elevator to go to my room, and the elevator operator says, uh, you monkeys get in the back so everybody can get in. I said, you're an elevator operator, and I'm a monkey. We went out to get a taxi. Taxis were lined up out in front of the hotel. And Cookie Gilchrist, one of our players, says, hey, uh, we want a taxi. And the guy says, uh, we got to call y'all a colored cab. And Cookie said, hey, I don't care what color the cab is. I just want a taxi. Why can't we ride in one of these? So we decided we're going to visit the French Quarter. The greeter standing there calling out to people, come in here, come in here, when we get close by. Like a, like a mute. And we get to another door. We get ready to go in. This little guy standing there pulls out a gun. You are not coming in here. You niggas are not coming in here. As a black man, I cannot go through this indignity and play a game here. We were the last athletes, or the last guys you want to try to intimidate. We decided to have a meeting. We decided, you know, I got to play. You always remember the funny things that happen in situations like this. This is OK, we're not going to play, right? We're not going to play. So Abner Haynes said, now, don't let me go home and turn on TV and see you guys playing. And I think then the question was, was the AFL going to scold them, go ahead and play the game without them, or were they going to support their players? And to the AFL's credit, they stepped up and supported their players and moved the game to Houston. The fourth annual American Football League All-Star Game switched from New Orleans due to a racial incident attracts a slim crowd of only 15,000 to Jepson Stadium in Houston, Texas. Keith Lincoln takes a pitch out around the right side. West blockers do a great job clearing the way. San Diego fullback steps off 80 yards to register another touchdown for the West. The actual game was no Super Bowl, and the walkout was no Selma. 
but the AFL player boycott had a lasting impact. I don't think that's ever been done before. I don't think there's a case of a boycott of a, of a professional sport by the players. And certainly athletes at that time were a privileged few enjoying benefits that very few other blacks enjoyed. And for this group of athletes to jeopardize that position, I took a lot of courage. To have done anything else would have been a slap in the face of some of the civil rights marchers who were giving up a lot more than what we had given up. By 1965, America and the American Football League had come a long way. But there was still a long way to go. My general manager, Mr. Stedman, was telling me, well, Abner, we don't condone what you did in New Orleans. And we think you led them. They wrote me a letter, two-page letter, explaining to me how a football player's role is not to help his people. All I'm supposed to do is to play football and keep my mouth shut. Within two days, two or three days, I was traded to Denver. You'd be surprised how many were out of the game within a year or two. I know Cookie Gilchrist's career went down the drain after that. But I'm more concerned with being a good dad. And my son's not here and 20 and 30 years later, how I chickened out and didn't have no backbone. It was time for some men to stand up and be counted. I think that's what we did. On the next Full Color Football. When Tex Schramm talked about the war in the 60s, he wasn't referring to Vietnam. He was talking about the NFL and the AFL. Al's strategy was take them on, then become better than them. The last guy they told about the merger was Davis. And when he found out, he was really pissed off. The war between the leagues continues through the first Super Bowl, next week on Full Color Football, the history of the American Football League.